I'm Luca and I have a technical background. I uh, started about 20 years ago in professional software development and uh, digital product development. During my years, I shift my interest from inside the team to slowly extending it to the rest of the organization and the business. And uh, during this journey, I noticed that uh, the technician that uh, uh, I admired most uh, and the one that they were more effective were the one that they were able to connect their technical work to the business problem that they were trying to solve. And this is what attracted me into looking the business side of uh, uh, technology. Um, I'm Paolo. Uh, that is a picture from I don't know, years ago. Um, I have a technical background as well, um, especially um, in agile development. I started like um, agile probably in the early 2000s. Um, and I worked for in racing and Formula One and pharmaceutical and some other industries. I we worked together at some point. There's uh, some names in common. And um, as Luca was saying, um, we, we you know we think that you know of course the technical skills are something you need, but uh, you need a way to communicate with the business. There's not just um, you know. Um, creating a story and trying to implement it without um, fully, fully understanding the domain and what they're trying to do. Because sometimes, well, we all know this, right? Sometimes the clients come up with the solution. They ask you to implement something which is what they think is a solution. And you and you have to climb back and try to understand what the problem is. And there's a lot of um, things that you can learn from them. And they can learn from the technical um, side of business. That's it. Yeah. We work in Ferrari together, indeed, and this is where we... I was driving, Luca took a picture of this. <laughs> the halo, probably, in your days. <laughs> and this is where we get deeply in contact with the business. Um, today we will describe four situations, and for each one we will have a kind of happy face story and a great success story. And uh, after preparing this uh, presentation, we noticed that all the success stories came from our experience from Formula One. Uh, I think just because uh, uh, the success there were more evident and easier to, to tell. So, going back when I, when I started uh, um, in IT, uh, I was a software developer. I was really trying to solve technical problems, understand how to make things work. That was my main uh, concern when I started, right? Uh, dealing with new technology, trying to understand and learn what it means to be a good IT professional. That was all about uh, that. And I was trying to answer uh, these questions. A few years later, five, let's say, uh, I tried to find uh, some, I found some answer to those questions that at that time seems uh, good answers for me. During that time, I was starting to get in touch with the, with the business or people from product, sometimes asking me to do estimates, sometimes even when we really didn't know the requirement or what we were trying to achieve. And I was there very scared. Oh my God, what if they expect me to be accountable for those estimates based on nothing? And on my side, uh, business and product people sometimes were asking questions and I was trying to explain things to them in a language that nowadays I realize were completely incomprehensible for business and the product people, right? Using strange technical terms and uh, getting into complicated details that were completely irrelevant for them. My relationship at the time or the relationship between business and IT, I would say adversarial was maybe too big, uh, maybe that term is too big, but to give you an idea, we had different trade-offs, different goals. Later on in my career, then uh, something changed. I start to realize that uh, the previous answers were not really the right one. Things were very different. And this talk is really about uh, uh, how business and technology can understand each other and make decisions that benefit each other. So let's talk about yourself. Is anyone here from product and business? Yes? So 
uh, you are the minority, you need to speak louder. Uh, do you remember, can you remember any case where some business opportunity was lost because of technical constraint or limitation? Anything uh, special? For me, it could be anything like you could talk about British Airways or different companies that completely collapsed and lost $80 million based on a small hiccup in APIs. It's yeah. a very good example. <clears throat> And uh, well, I think is the majority uh, who else is from technology? Can you? And I think we have some outliers instead. You are from, if not technology and product or business, where are you from? Yeah, and uh, from which part of the business, the company? Yeah. Um, so, can you remember? Any occasion where a business decision has a negative impact on the technology? Can you mention something that you have in your mind? When business make the decision, how we need to do? So, to a technical decision, basically. Even signing contracts. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then how do we put this work now? Okay. Yeah. So here we are with our four uh, real life situations, and uh, let's see if they resonate with you and what learning we got from them. So the first situation is a very happy one a successful company expanding uh, potential into, into new international markets or just the number of users uh, the products start to be very successful and here we have our first epic fail uh, story from a fintech company and uh, from banking geographic expansion and moving from early adopters to uh, early mainstream early adopters traditional users it means uh, uh, for example uh, adapting to different regulation in different countries, integrating with different uh, technological ecosystems. <laughs> Things about payment. Every country has different uh, payment providers or online payment providers. Uh, slightly different user problems and habits in different countries. And in general, when you move from early adopters to early majority, it's different type of tar target segments, so they need the different things. <coughs> so, at that time in those companies, uh, they couldn't respond quickly to those needs. Adapt to new regulation, integrate with new payments, change fe features to uh, serve a different type of customers, or simply scale. Because uh, for IT and technology, it wasn't possible to uh, create, uh, keep the code base and the infrastructure in a good shape. So there was, it wasn't possible. The business was coming to them. We want to expand. We want to grow, and we need this. And the answer was, well, we can't do this fast enough for you. So the solution was uh, cutting corner, taking shortcuts in order to uh, hit the deadline and the required time to market. Uh, one time was about duplicating the code base for every single country. That's how we're going to do that, guys. There's no other way. Another time, well, this maybe is for technical people spreading conditional statement and flags everywhere. That's another terrible technical solution. But from a business point of view, what it means later? Maintenance and development time was ballooning up. Search of costs for uh, per users and in general per IT operation. Uh, was it became extremely expensive. The headcount of the IT department in order to support the, uh, those uh, uh, duplication of code base went incredibly up 10 times. And so uh, those companies start to move from a technical debt toward a technical bankruptcy, impacting the business. This is another uh, epic fail example. In this case, uh, two different things happened. Uh, it was the tech <coughs> side that won the argument. We will do the things in our way, so please wait and take time. We will do everything perfect this time. You business will have to wait. Or simply the technology 
uh, was at the end of its life cycle. So there wasn't any other change, chance that wait and fix the technology. The business had to wait, to wait, to slow down, to slow down, to the point that crash on his side. The business opportunities were lost uh, and uh, the clients were not there anymore. So it didn't went well anyway. Well, that's our happy story from Formula One. In, in our case, it was not about expanding a new market, but definitely expanding one uh, experimental applications uh, in becoming an official application for the old team. We have, for example, in that case, race engineers that actually are good coders. They use Excel or MATLAB to create simulation, to uh, compare telemetry, uh, to use new mathematical model connected to uh, historical data. Yeah, and maybe I can add something on this. So, so um, th the way it generally works is that, um, as Luca was pointing out, uh, in, in Formula One, they're all engineers, so most of them can do some coding, and some of them are very good. Not all of them, but some of them are very good. And they can also build mathematical models, so they can use different tools like Excel, of course, because there's Excel everywhere, we know. And uh, MATLAB, uh, which is like Python, but it's a mathematical uh, language. Simulink, which is a tool to build uh, models. And what they remember that uh, you know we used to say um, race starts at two o'clock because you know every week or every other week there's there's a deadline for something. So sometimes these engineers are trying out ideas, and maybe they they try their ideas on on old telemetry data that was acquired in the past, like in the past few um, um, races. And, and if they come up with something that's, um, that looks good, they might want to try it during the race weekend. Okay, But how do you roll out this new feature or thing to, the whole, um, to all the engineers at the track? And what if it goes wrong? So um, this was possible because we had done a lot of work to put an infrastructure in place where uh, changes could be very small. So our main product was a sort of a, an operating system and every feature was more like an app. So features could be put in a sort of a container with versions and so it was and we could open different versions to different users. So in this case for example an engineer can come up with I don't know a tire degradation simulation for example that kind of works, he's happy with that but he wants to roll it out to other uh, tire engineers or vehicle dynamics engineers, so he can, you know, he can work on this feature, and then we can put this feature in our main app, and this feature is versioned, and and, and we can decide um, who to open this version to, right? How many different people, whether they are at the track or are back at the at the factory, and if there's something that goes wrong with that, we've put in place a system to. Uh, just switch versions and roll back to pull this feature out. So the idea is consider features as if they were little apps and consider your main app as an operating system instead and make sure that you can always go back and forth with versions and of course you need to maintain compatibility. But to do this you also have, you need continuous integration, you need tools, you need uh, tests, you need not only unit tests but especially integration tests. Because uh, if it's a simulation, you probably are running the simulation against some data, like telemetry, and then the output is other data. You want to be able to compare this data with you know, data from different simulation of the same problem, right? So we had to, to build a lot of tools to make engineers write tests for their simulations. And so there's a lot of work that eventually um, you know, allowed this to, to happen. So it's not easy, but eventually we got them. Yeah, you can think um, when you move to an official application, additional things that are required to provide normal services uh, are, for example, enabling that small application created by a single race engineer to work in a multi-user environment, to work in a multi-site environment at the racetrack, at the test track, and at the own factory at the same time. To have a remote access and replication, uh, data actually and server, servers are actually traveling together with the car around the world, some of the servers. Uh, so you have to prepare the application to do that. And as Paolo was mentioning, mentioning versioning and remediation plans, security and backup, 
And the way we managed to do that on time for the business was following some technical practices, making sure that our code base, our infrastructure was in a good state. We had a rental list virtue of simplicity, always striving for simplicity, avoiding unnecessary complexity and over-engineering constantly. I can mention KISS principle, uh, YAGNI, uh, avoiding premature optimization and generalization. So that discipline and those technical skills uh, to always go for simplicity, otherwise iPhone will look like this today. And on the other side, extremely simple design. So talking about a good uh, uh, architecture and the conversation with the business, understand where there is more uncertainty and where from a technical point of view we are holding the lower ground where small changes can potentially create a big cost in the future and in those specific situations make low cost, introduce low cost high value flexibility where is most needed. I'm talking about uh, uh, modularity, separation of concern, low coupling or open close principle, don't repeat yourself, avoid the duplication uh, just, and things like that. Just one thing I want to add on this uh, mm -hmm. simple design. Simple design uh, is not just uh, that you know you unit test your classes, you, you try and you know separate the logic in your application, it's not just that, it's also try to avoid to add technology into the technologies into the stack and this can come from both the business side and from the technical uh, people. Uh, from the technical people, it's quite often things like, oh, let's put the, you know, the newest JavaScript framework in this in our stack, or we need to implement a little queue, let's uh, use this framework, or, you know, and then you have to maintain it. There's a cost for everything. So one is always um, try to keep it simple and make sure that you actually need those things because they will be maintained. At the same time, this problem can, can arise from the business because as I was saying before, they might just go and sign a contract with a vendor of some technology and then come to the IT people, the people saying, oh, this is really cool, we want to integrate it in our app. And sometimes they don't even know that they don't need it. Um, because, you know, the same thing can be achieved, you know, with doing something different. It's because maybe they buy something which is big just to solve one small problem. That could, if they share the problem with the rest of the the um, department, maybe you have a different solution. Yeah, really. So it's not just coding, this is more a broader thing. We, we saw that go, go wrong where the idea to pursue simplicity actually turned uh, uh, very bad in uh, yeah. investing in unnecessary fl upfront flexibility, uh, uh, conf configurability or obsession or excessive flexibility that turned it into cost. The second example is uh, uh, having technical flexibility to enable option for strategic business decision. Is when the company, for example, have a, a product that is going well, they want to create new products and they want to uh, use uh, uh, the existing uh, product, they want to reuse part of the existing product in their company. So, yeah, here we are, online market <coughs> research and fintech example creating new products and reusing and integrating part of the existing one, right? You did something before, you have it there, it's your capital, can you reuse it to go faster in order to create new things? That's the question, that's what the business uh, wants, sometimes they call it product architecture from a business point of view, mixing and matching part of the existing product. But that's what the business got. Because of the poor status of the code base and the poor status of the infrastructure, there were so many technical limitations that uh, uh, the only option for the business was a menu with only one item on it, a cold soup, and not even a spoon to eat it. <laughs> that is the reality. Uh, the possibility to decide about a building, about uh, uh, adapting, uh, reusing, uh, part of the existing product versus buying new services wasn't there because there was not enough flexibility from the technical point of view to enable this decision that from a business point of view or a product point of view are obvious. Do I want to reuse what I get? Do I want to make it better in order to, to adapt <coughs> it to the new circumstances? Or do I want to buy a new one? Our simple question that technology should uh, be able to answer and to provide those options. 
but that was not uh, that was not possible. And also there was technology or vendors lock in because the impact of switching to a different vendors of a different technology was uh, simply impossible. Too much time, uh, it was not possible to predict how to do it. A business person can decide, you know, we have that provider, that service provider, we are using that product, and now there is a different one that costs much less. We want to switch to that different platform. Uh, to that different virtualization provider and so on. Can we do that? No, our system is like this. Uh, we cannot separate them. There is no option. Cold soup, no spoon. Go ahead. Well, in, uh, in a Formula One, we, we face something similar. Sometimes we had to switch to different technologies, for example, or upgrade to a new version of tools, framework, and so on. Yeah, so there's very many examples of this. Um, one is, um, the, like in 2008, uh, the FIA, which is the, you know, what will make the rules in Formula One, decided uh, to allow team with um, not much money as the big team to compete. Uh, there, you know, there, there was, um, <coughs> someone would have to build a standard, like a standard uh, control unit or some standard software so that even if you have a small team and you want to race in F1, you have enough money to you know, buy a license for that. But then of course the, uh, the big teams, they had their own software and a lot of tools built on those software and the, da and the data of, you know, generated by the software. So in that case, uh, for example, the, the big team had to build a lot of adapters and bridges to make sure that even if they were forced to use this new technology, they somehow could uh, encapsulate this into a box and you know adapt it and so that it would fit in their um, architecture. But it's it's a big thing. It's the in this case this was the um, control unit on the car, which is the, you know the, the thing that records all the inputs from the sensor. So it's it's, it's the the, the operating the system, car. the hardware of the car is the operating system of the car, so a big one. And also, um, also there was a tools Luca mentioned is because, um, say for example, you have a big application and it's 2006 or 2007, and the whole lot is being built with Microsoft tools, right? So at the time, there was no Git, uh, but there were, you know, there were like things that were better than sourcing. Thing, right? But still, uh, you're constrained because you are in an environment that you can't sort of break apart into small pieces, and this was um, this caused a, a caused a, a lot of pain. So we had to do a lot of work to try and break our development environment into pieces. The tool so chain. The tool chain. I, I, yes, thank you. Um, so that we could use a different continuous integration or um, um, even different source control. And um, and this is almost always the recipe is to break like big monolithic architectures into pieces, but not necessarily starting from pieces. Because I mean, these days I hear a lot of you know a lot of people talking about microservices and stuff, but I still don't buy the idea of starting something you know built on microservices. I've what I've seen. Things like microservices work is where you have something big and you extract services from this big thing rather than try and imagine the whole lot from scratch in little services. But sorry, I was going a bit outside. But in terms of tool chain, yes, a lot of work into breaking the tool chain apart and make sure even sometimes language you want to upgrade from I don't know C sharp one to C sharp four point six or even a different language because maybe you're now dealing with a different control unit that uh, runs a, an operating system that you want to um, connect to with a different language altogether. There's a lot of breaking things apart, make sure they are testable uh, separately, and, um, and that's what you need before you can do that. Yeah. In the cases where we managed to, for example, break down the tool chain in small pieces, we were able to do the upgrade during the racing championship. So we were able to get immediately the benefit of those upgrades. Where there was too rigidity and we only had the chance to uh, uh, upgrade everything or wait, we had to wait to the end of the championship because it wasn't too big. And we couldn't say the race engineer and the driver, you know, wait for what you're asking uh, because we are migrating our system. 
well, they are competing for the championship, they need the same competitive advantage that the other race are getting. And uh, telling the business, because for us, the race engineers and the drivers are our business, you cannot tell the business, wait, they are competing now and they need our help now. So we moved from high coupling, like Paolo was saying, to uh, low coupling, and from monolith to modularity. Uh, and uh, as Paolo was mentioning, we did it right, but we also have seen this do wrong. I don't know if you are old enough to remember the term DLL hell. Nowadays, there are many microservices hell, and that's what Paolo was talking about. So you need a way to do it in a way that fit for the business goal, not for a technology speculative heart. Um, just one thing I want to add on that very uh, quickly is that uh, Luca said that um, all these success stories are from F1. And it's not because F1 is cool perfect. or perfect, but I think there's something in F1 that sort of forced us to build that um, um, sort of um, logic or the, to build that way of doing things. Uh, and it's that the deadline are just you know every week or every, every other week. So you can't push a deadline. So for some other projects, you can say, oh, I think we're a bit slow on this. And OK, maybe we can push this to, say, two weeks and maybe put more developers. Never works, but anyway. Um, or maybe we can do this first and then just this later. Whereas if you have rhythm, like you know, every week there's a race or every other week, then at some point, you, you like, we you know, learn this that. is not working. We need something. We need a plan. That's why I think we have more success stories in our F1 experience. Yeah, that speed of learning. Yeah. We, we, we made mistakes, but we learned it so fast that uh, yeah. we reached to that point. Uh, and talking about moving fast and reducing time to market, here I have an online gaming and betting company. It was the time when there wasn't much uh, uh, online poker gaming. And the founders created one of the first platforms <coughs> on online uh, uh, poker gaming. So they made a huge amount of money. Later on, other players come into the field and uh, they start to compete. So uh, <coughs> lower margin, uh, more feature, lower prices. <coughs> and then the business want to go faster because competitors are catching up. <coughs> So go fast, go fast, go fast, to the point that your code base and your technology is in such a bad uh, <coughs> shape that adding new feature is, uh, looks uh, uh, more and more like climbing a human tower or making a move at Jenga. It becomes harder and harder. And uh, the business say, go fast, mm. go fast, and uh, the technology uh, just uh, goes slower and slower. Uh, customers that are unhappy miss a deadline, profit reduced by higher cost and uh, lowering margin because the cost increases, outpaced by competitors that start new with the code, new code base uh, using your ideas uh, that work on the market, but that now using a new technology starting greenfield from scratch, so going incredibly faster. Uh, lower prices because they also fight you in terms of prices and diminished predictability about what you are doing. <coughs> the company lost momentum in this specific case, has been bought by a British competitor. They moved all the users into their system and they threw away the old IT system and fired everyone. So that's <coughs> how it ended. The success story, well, we, we don't have competitors uh, from a pricing or market point of view in Formula One, but we have competing team. And uh, uh, we want as a technology to maximize the feature or the competitive advantage that technology gives to the business during the championship. And that's what we want to do. We constantly want to give them a competitive advantage with new things. And we were, I think probably we, we covered this before actually, and, uh, and uh, <coughs> this is where we uh, we came up with this idea of of um, you know turning features into uh, mini apps where we could uh, put as many apps and with different versions um, in time for the next race and be being able to uh, put them offline or online or just open them to different um, to a, a small group of engineers, not everybody necessarily. And the evolving the huge code base with a few relatively small teams, uh, also this is key, 
um, in, in a lot of companies you find this big monolithic application and everything goes into that. Sometimes there's even one database and um, the only way you can actually make that work, especially if you have different teams, because there are companies where different departments have, um, have different teams of developers. And this is actually common in F1. You have, I don't know, the entire department, they might have some consultants that can write some code. And the error department as well, right? But eventually, all these bits and pieces have to go into the main app. And how do you deal with that if the main app is a big monolithic architecture? Well, there's only one way you have to break it. That's, that's the only thing. We put a lot of uh, discipline into that. Paolo mentioned before how the uh, mandatory deadline. Uh, actually, the FIA calendar is inescapable. So we have mandatory deadline and that mandate our uh, learning cycle. And that's great because when we take some bad decision in Formula mm -hmm. One, immediately after the next race, maybe we are working the same part of the of the feature, we immediately see uh, what we did, uh, if that is worth helping us or if that is slowing down. And we immediately learn that. And we see, and we understand the real value of quality, the things that we do that enable us to, to continue to go fast, and the things that we do that instead make us go slow, or don't give us any real advantage. So it was nice, you know, you can, you can look, uh, show that to your co-workers, but when you talk with the business, no real value added in that speculative uh, uh, work. So we put in place the right practices. Uh, we make sure that we could go, f go faster, but at the same time safer. And instead of having a human tower or a Jenga, we have a puzzle where we are free to add the new pieces, uh, maintaining the same piece indefinitely and serving the business and product need. Uh, this, we should say, took years, not days, to, <laughs> to do this. So it's not that, you know, it's not easy to well, first of all, you have to understand the domain. So when you start working with a company like this big, and they have a big um, application, you need to fully understand the domain. You need to, in fact, you need to understand if you can delete stuff from the application to start with, because there are a lot of uh, sometimes dead features, uh, zombie features in the application. So reduce the we reduce the code base, and you have less, you know, fewer problems. That's that's one thing, but it does take um, um, months or even years in some cases, and you need the business to back you up. So you need to collaborate. Yes. But when it works, you see business value. After oh, yeah. that, you see it immediately. So, so. Uh, the last case is uh, ensuring basic product reliability. So we are in a situation where a company is really struggling with reliability and uh, is struggling to maintain customers' trust. Uh, they need to improve company reputation, limit users' frustration, and ensure continuity, uh, otherwise they affect their revenue stream. This is when uh, yeah, you start to have some, some real problems. So what happened is that everybody is busy firefighting, uh, trying to keep the system up and running, avoiding interruption, and uh, reputational damage and all the bad things that I described before. It happened in many companies to find themselves in this situation. Uh, the fact is that uh, people are so busy dealing with bugs that uh, they don't have time to create a new feature anymore. It's more solving the bugs than uh, going ahead uh, uh, and, and compete with your competitors. Uh, uh, one bad thing that we noticed in this situation when there, when there are a lot of money is that the company decide to create two teams then. One that create new features and one that fix bugs. So you have one team that uh, is rewarded to deliver quickly uh, with no quality because it's about speed. And the other that is trying to fix the bugs from the other team. I've been lucky enough to do due diligence on different companies that have the same type of products, the same type of market in terms of size. And uh, uh, one company had the teams taking care of the whole life cycle, and the other had the competing team, delivery team, and bug fixing and support team. The difference was that one company had 50 
50 technicians, the other 500. And I see this pattern <laughs> repeated in other, in other companies. Uh, this was a financial sector. Another uh, that we saw a problem was uh, um, in uh, uh, fashion, uh, where initially we had that situation. So things that could be done by 30, 50 people actually handled by 400, 500 people because of this. There's one thing um, that we can say on that, which is, <clears throat> and this is probably more on the technology, technology side, which is, yeah, of course you want to, you know, simplify code, the code base and everything, but um, sometimes you need to sort of ensure that this culture is shared, uh, um, you know, among the developers, because I've seen a lot of places where developers don't really finish the story, the stories they're working on, like they do the like 70%, 80% of it, and then they leave the rest to fine tuning. Or some of them have a, a DevOps board, which is actually something that when when it's done, the job is really complete, right? So people, they start writing some code, and then the feature is almost there, and then there's fine tuning, like the UI is not there, and there's a, an exception in this, uh, you know, this happens, or it doesn't work in this scenario, and this, this, and that, so it's not there. The, the feature is not there. But they have, they just uh, think, okay, but then the DevOps can pick up the card and write some scripts, or maybe the UX can do some tweaks. Still, it's not finished. The story is not finished. And um, I think that's the same thing, right? You, you hire two teams, and then you allow the first team to just hack their way through the uh, delivery. And then, then you have people trying to catch up with the mess they're creating. And of course, it's entropy, right? So it's not linear. It just... It just goes up. Yeah, I, I'm talking about ten times more people, ten times more costs, ten times more time in terms of business uh, consequences. The Formula One story, instead, uh, I mentioned again, we we didn't create extra complexity and extra work for our race team, the user, because we let bugs and problems leap into uh, the released feature. Uh, they are working hard every second count when they are at the racetrack. So you cannot uh, uh, release something that is uh, uh, not complete. You cannot tell them, you know, in order to install this, you have to act the config file. You have to do something. You know, their mind is on the driver, on the competition, and they are 100% there. What you are giving to them is something that should help their works, not uh, create additional headaches. Uh, and uh, we need to learn to recover quickly from bugs and incidents. Mistakes happen. Making mistakes is a normal part of human life. The point is recovering quickly and minimizing the consequences of mistake and incidents. So that's me again driving. <laughs> We definitely had the single team taking full responsibility of the whole life cycle from ideation to decommissioning. Uh, instead of just fixing bugs, we were removing, investigating and removing the root cause uh, without trying to blame people, otherwise people <coughs> hide, but with the culture of uh, uh, acceptance that people make mistakes, exploring uh, the root cause and removing it. And instead of having last mile a Q and A again, we didn't even have testers. We started to test uh, the moment that we started to write code. So you can think so far. We we described to you some uh, uh, success story and some epic face story. You can think, oh, I will I will write down what those guys did uh, right, and then I will just repeat that, and everything will will work, right? I think there is another hidden uh, lesson in these stories. Yes, the good practices uh, are definitely go good. We saw something that doesn't work and something that does work. But there is something more, and it's about the relationship between business and technology. I think that was, together with the uh, speed of learning, with the frequent feedback, uh, uh, there is something more. The understanding that uh, uh, technical decision can have a positive impact on business and business decision can have a positive impact on technology or the other way around. And this can create a virtuous circle or a vicious circle. When, the, when we are in a down spiral, technology goes from a technical debt to technical bankruptcy. And the business goes from slow sales and non-competitive products 
to shrinking market share and losses. And usually those things, strangely enough, happen together because one drag down the other. The upward spiral is that IT and technology goes from continuous improvement to technical excellence. And when that is contextual to the real business needs, it has business to go from good product to great profits. So this is a, a quote for you of the relation between technology and business. This is how IT and technology become part of a, a Formula One. We start from the 70s where we just have some telemetry, McLaren, uh, 18, the, the technology start to enter the car. So things that nowadays we have in our car that start to be there in order to win races. Uh, uh, traction control, start control, and, and so on. Uh, until to the 90s where uh, there was a real-time computing, a real-time telemetry, uh, simulation and so on. And nowadays when you, ha when you are driving a Formula One car and you steer the wheel or you press the brake or push the gas, it's like a video game. There is no more mechanical interaction. You are interacting with the computer like in a video game and that computer drives the engine and everything. IT and technology is at the heart of your product. Nowadays, when you say product, you are really saying digital products. When you say business, you are really saying digital business. And you need to be aware of that. And cars, uh, so this is Formula One, but if you think about Tesla, you are sitting in a car, but you are playing a video game with the computer, and the computer is driving the car for you, so you cannot ignore Out that space. anymore. <laughs> this is another quote. So, it is inescapable for business and technology to come together as one. It is something that is inescapable. And if you're not having conversation nowadays, and, and if you're not doing that, you are part of the past. So what conclusion then? Well, I can tell you my story. I started here, right? I learned uh, all that uh, technical mm -hmm. excellence and business cr and uh, technical craftsmanship, and I think that that was good. I was a great professional. But then, uh, also thanks to my experience in Ferrari, I learned that something was was really different. It wasn't just that; there was more than that. So when you look at technical excellence and craftsmanship, the real test is the utility for the business. Are our technology and our technical decision uh, making money or achieving goal for the business? And then from the business side, the lesson is that IT is part of the business. It's not replacing the business, but they are one thing. When we look at the status quo, so that's the normal <coughs> situation. Uh, shareholders, board, execs, they want some business impact. They bring in product managers, business stakeholder, UX, and they define a product vision or a product strategy. Yeah, <laughs> IT come into play and start to implement that product strategy. Sometimes later, technical excellence produce some great output and happy end users see the result of it. They start to buy our product and voila, business impact, the one that we want. There is something deeply wrong in this. It's a disjointed conversation. Those people don't talk together and cannot work together. If you want the, one of the secret sauce, one, uh, hid, one of the hidden lessons is that when we start from the desired business uh, impact, we need the product vision, we need technical excellence, we need uh, uh, feedback from our hand users and we need the measure of business impact to happen at the same time. So those things need to go ahead connected with the 
conversation of those people working together in small slices, like uh, every week races, for example, creating feedback and immediately measuring uh, the result of what we are doing. And in that context, because every company is different from each other, start to learn what it really works in that context and what it doesn't. And those are the type of feedback loops and conversation that we need. So here, here we go again. This is, a, this is the, our learning. And these are my provocative questions to business and tech. Are you ready to do this step? Or do you want to uh, look at the craftsmanship uh, books and say, oh, that's, that's the Bible, I know how to do that, and that's it, and stay alone in your, in your ivory tower? Do you want to exit your ivory tower or not? And business, are you ready to understand that uh, digital is the new business? And this is about responsibility, taking responsibility. Technology for time, cost, and tangible benefits, not just uh, quality that you can brag about. And from the business, are you ready to take responsibility of your decision, the impact that you have on technology? Because that impact will come back to bite you or to reward you. The strategy needs to pl be planned together with the... Well. I think we are perfectly on time and in the end. This is us. Um, last things that we ask for you, we have some post it there and some feedback. So let us know uh, if what you enjoyed, uh, what uh, confused you, or what dis you dislike. And if you leave us uh, uh, your email, we can share uh, the deck and some additional ring, uh, link to you. That's all. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thank you.